Thank you so much, everyone. That is a big welcome and a big introduction. You know, but, but I was thankful to God because it's a very realistic introduction. I, I remembered uh, when, um, when I was introduced in one of our Filipino events. You know, ask, ask Filipino. If you're not Filipino here, you're going to learn something, okay? When, uh, when you go for Filipino event, you know, they will really, really, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of talking going on and they will give big introductions. And I remembered um, when, when I was actually um, invited in a 50th birthday party. And uh, one of our church people introduced me. And then the way she talked about me, I stood there and I said, oh, I want to know who you're talking about, you know. And because it was, it was like, I have no idea who that person was. But thank you so much, uh, Pastor Corny, because, because that is such an amazing introduction. Uh, I, I think it's, it's more real because I love the fact that you talk about my wife. My wife is Anusha. You can see at the back here that I'm really blessed by such a beautiful family. Uh, could you just could you just put the, uh, yeah, there you are. So this is in Melbourne, Australia. That's Lolo and Lola. My, my, my parents are there. But that's my wife. And uh, for some of you, might not know me, I've, uh, when, when I was uh, younger, I always said to God, God, give me a tall wife. <laughs> I've always prayed because I said, if I will marry somebody smaller than me, it will remind me of my mother. And I do not want to be married to somebody that reminds me of my mother every day. You know, I love my mother, but I need a wife. So God had been, that's why, that's why young people over here, all the men here, you have to be very specific to God. Okay, so, and, and I said, I want a wife who, 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 who actually can cook amazing Indian food, Malaysian food. No, no, I, I did not ask God for a domestic helper, uh, <laughs> but I, I asked God for a partner in life. And, and that was, honestly, I was very desperate. You know, some of you young people here, you're not desperate enough. That's why you don't get something. So I was, I was actually desperate because when I was, when I was younger, um, I was 28 years old and I was a missionary in Malaysia for so many years. And, and I said, God, Please give me somebody, you know. And as a pastor, it's hard to be dating somebody, you know. Especially, especially you're preaching like this, and one of the one of the beautiful young ladies winked at you and said, "Hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'll be married." You know, you can't propose marriage while you're preaching. And I said, "God, I am desperate. Give me somebody who will be a partner in ministry." And God gave me my beautiful Anusha. And it's very easy to uh, remember her name because Anusha, yeah, Anusha. So when we went to the Philippines. I was walking in the Philippines, and but that's my Indian family, of course, my in-laws, and uh, thank God I was not married to outlaws. You know, sometimes in-laws can become outlaws. My mother-in-law is amazing. I'm telling you, I have the best mother-in-law in the planet because she treats my wife as a daughter-in-law and she treats me like a real son. Isn't that true, Brother Jogesh? Yeah, that, that's how the mother-in-laws, Indian mother-in-laws, right, right? So you get a, an amazing favor, you know, because I understand the language and every time in the Indian culture, the moment you sit down, the, the mother will ask in their language, in Malayalam, say, uh, Kuricho, oh, no, kuri, not, not, not Kuricho, but, but they'll say, have you, have you, uh, um, have you give, asked pastor for a drink? And, I, you know, they didn't realize I picked up the language very, very fast. And I, said, I would say, Ma, she didn't yet. And then my mother would be so upset. So I will always take advantage of that because, because, because uh, my wife would be looking at me and say, Ma, look, she's looking at me. Hey, go make a drink for your husband. Like, ah, thank God, you know. So, so I'm promoting the Indian culture here, Brother Jogesh, so especially for the amazing uh, people here. But I'm just saying this because today is an amazing day. Uh, and the last couple of days have been so great for us. So you can take away the picture of my family day. I just want us to, to, to look into God doing something in our lives, in our ministries, in the things that we're doing. Because life has been so hard in the last two to three years. Sometimes the person right next to you make the life harder. Uh, no, no, not, not really. Uh, if you're beside your spouse, <laughs> please don't say that, okay? Sometimes, you know, the closest people to us makes our life harder. But when I'm saying this is that the reality is that the world has just come out from the most miserable, dark moments we've ever, ever faced in our lives. And now the church is coming back, and when we are coming back, we are looking at, you know, multiplication, we are looking at growth, we're looking at bringing back all these things in place. But can I just tell you that God did not call us, to, did not allow us to go to the pandemic to be doing the same old, same old, same old, same old again. Okay? Look at the person right next to you. Do you know that person for at least 10 years? Yeah? 
You know, sometimes some people, for the last 10 years, they're like Jesus. Or they're like God. They never change, right? The hairstyle is the same. You know, the, uh, the color of the hair is the same. You know, but what I mean is that there is no changes. But I believe that God forced the world for a massive reset, okay? Because He needs us to wake up and to get ready for something significant, something bigger than us. The pandemic had limited you. It limited your environment. It choked your relationship. It allowed you, it, it did not allow you to go beyond the four corners of your apartment. Or if you have five corners or six corners, it depends on you. If you live in a village, definitely four corners and a lot of animals, right? Especially if you are from uh, in Kenya. I mean, in Masai Mara. I mean, I've been, I've been to Kenya for, uh, uh, honestly, I love Kenya. That's the first African nation I've been to. You know, I have a specific love for Kenya. Of course, Zimbabwe, I've never been there, so I haven't, you know. I, 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 but Kenya was my first African nation. And honestly, it was the most amazing place ever because the people there are happier than the Filipinos. You don't need to give them something special, you know, to drink or <laughs> do anything. They're just happy. They're just happy. It feels like when you walk in the streets at Nairobi, everybody's in a musical. You know, they're well-dressed. It feels like, uh, you know, it, it, it's just like that. I don't know why I started talking about Kenya. Uh, I, I, I'm believing God that there's something significant that God is about to do in the nation of Kenya. Because you, you, you are one of the windows in Africa. And, um, and, and, and God is actually causing that window. You know, the enemy had actually for many years had destroyed that window in Kenya. That has actually removed your birthright in Africa. But God is about to bring back that birthright. That birthright to be across a section of the nation of Africa to be a landing pad in such a way you will be launching more people who, uh, who will serve God in missions all over the world. There's something that God had mandated in Kenya. You'll be releasing a, an army of young people in Kenya that will minister all across the world. Uh, God will destroy the tribal divisions over there. Uh, the, the divisions that happen and the tribalism that has been happening because, because the enemy had put in there this, this animosity between, between each other so he could, the enemy will not be able to move. But I'm believing God that in this next uh, 10 years, Kenya has a very, very important place in releasing the people of God, an army that will serve across the world. So uh, my, my brother, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just believing God with you. Um, now, not just because I love Kenya, but you know, Kenya is a very unique place. You know, um, I, love the, I love that the uh, traffic lights there are just a decoration. Yeah, yeah, it's a suggestion. You know, if it's red, it doesn't mean to say you stop. It may be saying faster. And when I was there, I was like, oh my God. I shouted and shouted. And, 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 and I love it because, you know, it, gave, it feels like you, when you drive across the streets of Nairobi, it feels like you are in a roller coaster. Because you have no idea where you will position yourself in the car to hide from the disaster. And they will do it with a smile. So I love, I love Kenya. And, but also, you know how to cook the right bacon. You know, the bacon in Australia is not the same. But anyway, uh, but the Kenyan bacon is very similar to the Filipino bacon. You know the crisp and the crunch. So, but anyway, stop. I just, I just need to stop all these things anymore. I believe that God is about to restore His church. I believe that, that when I was preparing for, for this, you know, God is just, I, I, said, I was seeking God. God, do I teach? Do I preach? Do I inspire? God, is say, God just told me, obey me. Just obey me because there is a specific word that he has started repeating and repeating all over again. And that is the word restoration. Sometimes we are focused about multipli multiplication. We are focused about the number. But can I just tell you that authentic growth happens when the fundamentals are done right. Sometimes we want this to be done. So sometimes we want to build a massive house, but you did not lay a foundation. If you want to build a massive house, the first thing you need to do is dig a foundation. When they were building the Burj Al Khalifa, they did not put matchsticks as foundation for Burj Al Khalifa. Right? How many of you have been on the top of Burj Al Khalifa? I mean, every time I go up on the top of that, I thank God that there are people who build that foundation. Because every time that the wind blows, I feel the shake in my head that is happening worse than the shake that happens during earthquakes in Baguio. How many of you have been there? I am so scared. Pastor Mal, I've never prayed so hard when I go to the tallest, it used to be the tallest building in the world. I went up there and the, the, when the wind blows, you feel like, 
You feel like you've drunk, even if you've not drunk. Not that I drink, but um, I drink water. But it was just this, oh God, did Pastor Moses put something in my drink? You know, uh, I, was, I was just worried at that time. But this is, this is the truth. When you look at this massive building, there are things in there. The grandeur of that is what mostly people would see. But never realize that there are foundations that have been laid to dig into the sand of the uh, of Emirates to make sure that those foundations, no matter how the tall the building will be, it will not fall and collapse. Sometimes our dreams and desires are so big, but we want to see the end result without producing the main foundation, without laying out the ground. Because laying out the ground is dirty, isn't it? How many of you have dug something from the soil? How many of you are from Congo? At least you dug something, you get gold or gold get diamonds. Isn't it, Pastor? Uh, I always make fun of Pastor Freddy because I know Pastor Freddy, you know, he always looks expensive. You know, so whenever we walk into, uh, into the mall here, they will sell all the different things to him. They will look, they look at him and they look at me, they look like I'm his personal assistant, you know? And I, I, I'm alright, you know, I've, I've faced that all my life, especially when I got married to my wife. And I went back to the Philippines, flew in the Philippines, and, and, then, and then I was actually pulling out the luggage. And you know how Filipinos are. We are very, very nosy. You know, we, we try to, we never mind our own business. We mind others' business, huh? So the business of others. And they asked me, so who's the person right next to you? Because she looks like Susmita Sen. She was so tall, and she was, uh, she was, she was amazing. I mean, I mean, she's like Susmita Sen, Priyanka Chopra combined, you know? And... <laughs> And, um, and then she was walking there with her beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful face. And, and he, me, the most common Filipino that will ne- no one will notice. So they noticed me because I was this, with beautif- this beautiful lady who's taller than me. And then they said, they asked me, who's, your, who's the person right next to you? Oh, that's my wife. Huh? You know, that, that, there was a disgust in the response. Like, how come? How blind was this person? So, so you, know, you know, sometimes we, you know, when you look at all these things, we never realize, you know, we aspire for something great. We aspire for something big. But we never want to dig the dirt to make sure the foundation is laid there. And I believe that God is calling the church back to, the, to, to something that He's unstripped everything that is human, everything that is man-made in the last few years to remind us that it is not about human methods that will create growth in church. It will be God-initiated uh, uh, plan that it will be through God that growth can happen in the church. You may have the best program in the world, the best program in the Middle East. You may have the best singers in the Middle East. You may get all the Zimbabwean dancers here li- lining up, including the Filipino dancers, including who else are the races here um, including the Australians who will uh, you know we, we will jump like kangaroos you know what, what I mean I mean you do all the gimmicks in, in, in place but without the power and the anointing of God without the spirit of God touching the lives of our people every method that you do will be nothing now, I just want to start with this because, because I, want to, I want to lay the ground of what I'll be sharing today. But before I do that, when, you know, when I was getting ready of my, my PowerPoint, you know, Pastor Gavin, in, you know, he's my roommate. And uh, I've never seen, you know, I, you know he's, he's a man of God that, you know, Pastor Gavin, would you kindly stand up over, over here? And, um, and he, you know, he, he, he's the one who follows us, not because he wants a preaching opportunity, but he was there. Every mission trip we go to, he's there to encourage us, to strengthen. And in that morning, I think that I was first, first night, uh, first, was it the second night on the jet lag? And I was just, because uh, I always wake up very early morning. And, um, and I was just typing, typing, typing and doing some things. And then suddenly he started sitting down there. God had said something to me. And I said to him, oh, I'm actually preparing that, you know, that, you know, I've prepared that same template, you know, the PowerPoint templates that actually is connected to the message that I want to share. So Pastor Gavin Sheen, can you just give a big hand to Pastor Gavin Sheen? Yeah, two nights ago, God woke me up at three o'clock in the morning and said, I have a message to give at the conference and a vision. My name is Gavin. I'm a missions pastor. And God called me and commissioned me to go to the nations of the world. And I've been doing it for 30 years. I have my own mission statement to come beside pastors and missionaries to encourage them, to teach them, to 
encourage them to use their God-given talents and giftings to attain to their God-given destiny. And I feel like Esther, that I was born for time like this. And every one of you here was born for time like this. And as Pastor Mel was saying before, we all have a job to do. We all, God has given each and every one of us a different thing to do. The message he gave me started off with Nicodemus. When Jesus said to him, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. You won't see the kingdom. And I thought, if you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. And God said the other night, the Holy Spirit said, that's not what it's about. It's about the kingdom. Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God so many times that the kingdom is close, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is where I am. And it, the Holy Spirit just opened up to me and said, Jesus said, I don't do anything or say anything unless I've seen the Father say it or seen what he's done. And I thought, how does he... Okay, in prayer you can get an answer of what, Jesus, is what God is saying to his son. But how does a son see what the Father is doing? And then the Holy Spirit said, because the kingdom is here. When you are born again, you step into another realm. You step into the spiritual realm. You have got one foot in the world and one foot in the spirit realm. You live in two different realms. And this is what God was telling me. He said, tell the people that they live in two different realms. And I want them to replicate what Jesus taught them to do. Jesus raised the dead. He healed the sick. He calmed the waters. That's what you're supposed to be doing. You are the disciples of Jesus Christ and you should be doing the same as what he did. Then God gave me a vision of a whole group of us church people walking along on a footpath and there was more people walking on a footpath a bit lower. And I said, what's that, Father? And he said, these are the people that are walking with head knowledge up here. They're the people that their head knowledge has been pushed down into their heart, into their spirit, into their soul and they walk with me. That's where he wants us walking. That's where I want to walk. I want to walk where Jesus walked. I've lived in Jerusalem, but different thing. I want to walk in that spiritual realm. And then God said to me, tell the people, I want to pour in new wine. I want to pour in new wine. But I've got too many old wineskins. We need to change who we are. We need to change how we run church, we can't keep doing the same formula week after week after week. We, you are living in a country where five times a day people do the same prayer, the same actions, the same everything. For what? We need to change who we are. We need to be new wineskins. We need to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit and do what he's telling us to do. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he's saying to each and every one of you. God gave me this message for you to change. Change how we run church. Change what you do because it's not just up to the pastors to bring the people in to see the kingdom grow. We need to be out where we are in our marketplace doing the things that the Father sent the Son to do, to heal the sick to raise the dead. We need to be doing those miracles, the signs and wonders in our workplace so people can say, what have you got that I don't have? Amen. Amen. We need to be raising up the people to bring into the churches and then the pastors can do what they've got to do. It's your job, your job, to do what Jesus did in the marketplace where he did the signs and wonders. That's up to you. God wants New wineskins. Give God the glory. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pastor Gavin. Let's pray. Hallelujah. 
Father, we are here. Our hearts are open. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the last few sessions, the many the sessions from the beginning, Lord, that, that God had spoke to us, had talked to us, had ministered to us, had inspired us. All of this, Lord, are being stitched together in such a fine wo woven garment, ga garment, Lord, to enable us, to strengthen us, to equip us, Lord, to face this new era, this new situation, this new normal that, God, you are bringing to the church, Father. Lord, if ever there's anyone in our midst right now who are exhausted, who are tired, Lord, who are going to different directions, I pray, Lord, that you will quicken each and everyone's spirits, Lord. That, Lord, after tonight's event, Lord, we will go out from this place, Lord. Not just different, but we will go out in this place that we have a reinforced mandate that has come from you. That, Lord, a reinforced anointing, but also an under, a, a, a girded, Lord, that we've been under a girded by... Lord, we are reinforced by your power and your Holy Spirit, Lord, to administer your plan in our lives. We thank you and honor you, God, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And the cry of my heart as I was preparing this message is that, God, restore us again. Restore us again. We need you. You know, when I'm talking about this restoration, the meaning that I'm saying is that, that there is a returning to something, uh, to a former owner place or a condition. There is a reinstatement of a previous practice, a, a, a right practice or a right situation. And God led me in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 4. It says here, uh, the year of the Lord's favor. And I'm believing God that, that VCGM and all the churches here and the churches all over the world, that God is causing us to enter into, the, the, into God's favor. When you talk about God's favor, it's, it's, the, it's a time of jubilee. You know, this is the same scripture that Jesus opened up when he started his ministry. But let's look into Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 4. Um, in page 50 of your uh, Bible, it says there, uh, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Did you, did you check if it's page 50? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the freedom of for the captives and to release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion and to bestow them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins they, and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined gates that has been devastated for generations. Let's jump to Isaiah 58 verse 12. It says there, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. I'm saying this to you with a heart uh, that is grieving at the moment knowing that we come from Australia and in Australia we have a different type of persecution. There is, there, is a, there is a persecution that is deliberately eliminating the name of Jesus in every public space in Australia at the moment. I think it's happening all over the world right now. There is this move in the last few years that has put human agenda over God's agenda. And, our, our, you know, and sometimes you know, this human agenda started creeping into the practices of the church. And when it started creeping into the practice of the church, what happens right now is that what seems to be a good idea that is man-made literally are not God-glorifying practices. And you know, when that happens, God will move and turn the tide and He will not allow His church to be defiled because this is His church. This is His, found, this is His ministry. And when that has happened, you know, God will actually reset everything and allow a new thing to, to, to start. But you know, sometimes we move away so much from where we started that because of that moving away, the very reason why we started became different. It was defiled. Now, when I'm saying this, you know, when you go for swimming, right? How many of you had gone swimming? You know, I remember one of the pastors in, our, in Victoria was talking about this. You know, he left, he left his, uh, he swam, and then he left um, his bag uh, at the beach. And then he started swimming and swimming and swimming, isn't it, Pastor Mel? And then, and you know, he went, how many of you love swimming at the beach? 
Uh, you, you, how many of you can't swim but you love swimming in the beach? Please start, please start swimming lessons, okay? Um, and, and, and what he did is that when he jumped in there, after maybe about 40 minutes, he got out of the beach and then he was looking. He was very distressed because he thought someone stole his stuff. But what he didn't realize, when you are inside the water, you don't realize that the water moves you so slowly, so slowly far away from where you started, that by the time you realize it, you are very, very far from that same point that you started. And as a church, God did not want us to go far from the main reason of who, uh, from where we were starting, where we started before. And today, I just want to encourage everybody because, because if God is calling us to multiply, if God is calling us to grow, the very, very first thing as a repairer of the world, we need to understand that we got to return back the kingdom agenda. Because we need to prepare the, uh, the bride of Christ for his return. The kingdom agenda is the great commission. Matthew chapter 28 uh, verses 18 uh, to 20. It, we know that this great commission is all about make disciples of all, of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are called to make disciples. And that is the kingdom agenda. In making a kingdom, uh, in creating kingdom disciples, we need to be able to understand that it is not about human agenda, but God's agenda. And the first restoration point that we need to look at the church of God at the moment is to return back to the original. Look at the person right next to you. Tell the person, I am OG. You know, nothing is like you. I mean, no, no one can replicate you. I mean, this is, this is the most important thing. There must be a returning back to the original. Now, when you talk about the original, am I saying that let's start singing hymns again? Uh, of course, we can still sing hymns. Am I sa saying that, that the hymns are more anointed than the songs that we're singing? Because, uh, you know, we always have complaints with older people and the young, younger generation in the church. Because I remember uh, some of the older people would say in the church, N none of you are here, right? none of you complain about that, right? You know, uh, because, because in the olden days, in the 80s, when we, when we do songs before, um, I remember when I first became a, um, a Christian, the, the most popular song is like, When David did it, you you know, some people think that if you sing that song, that's the most anointed praise and worship. But some people also think that if you, if you do this amazing new song released by this new album, that's the anointed worship. You know, new song, old song, the, it's a matter of the heart. It's never the matter of the song. And sometimes, you know, we are so focused into embellishing what should be a heart issue to make it show like, yeah, everything is okay. But the return to the original is so important because God is saying to here, you know, Mark chapter 11, verse 15 to 17, what is the original? What is the original purpose of the church of God? Um, don't go to number two yet. Mark 11, 17, it says there, and Jesus came to the temple, you know, and uh, I'll start with verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling the, there. He overturned the tables and of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. In, and in 17, it says there, as he taught them, he said, it is, not re is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you had made it a den of robbers. You know, when you look at the context of what has happened there, you know, people were at the temple at that time. People had used the temple to be a business enterprise. Now, now it was not directly with the temple, but you have a lot of people that are there. You know, they were, they were actually selling uh, stuff to people. I, I think selling stuff, one of them is like they will, sell, they will sell all the sacrifices. And the requirement of God for sacrifices is that if you're going to sacrifice, sacrifice from your own uh, from your own. A uh, lot, right? But you know, at, as early as that time, people loved everything quick, yeah? So they will use their money because they would come from different places all over, uh, not just within Israel. They would actually just buy stuff, okay? Oh, I like that sheep. I'm going to buy that. Three for one. Okay, at least I have three to, to give to, to God. So it became a, a transactional, you know, worship became transactional. You know, what is worse, it was not just transactional, but also um, there is also, a, a, you know, the, the business became a very, very, um, what, 
what do you call that? Um, um, the, the business people were taking advantage of other people. You know, the money changers were taking advantage of, pe uh, of people. You know, when our system does not empower people but takes away power from the people and takes advantage of them, God is angry. Sometimes we create this massive system that is so built on the high up and then it oppresses people. That is where God comes in into the picture and he says, I want my house to be a house of prayer. It is not a den of robbers. When you talk about house of prayer, you know, Pastor Graham, you and I were talking the other day, you were sharing this, that, that when you, your house is a house of prayer, it means God is not just looking for people who are consumers. Who will sit down there? Look at the person right next to you, especially if they're snoring. Just, just uh, you know, just uh, uh, you know, just just tickle them a little bit. Look at that, and and then you you will look into that, and God will just say, uh, he, he doesn't want the church to to be in a place where it's it's taking advantage of people, and and sometimes the attraction that happens in our church is that because there are systems there that that become so unfair, but God is saying that the house should only be. A house of prayer. If we want revival, if we want God to move, it starts when God cleanses His church. That the church should be defined as a house of prayer for all nations. I love this. You know, being an international pastor, Pastor Mel, you know, I love the, you know, that we have 107 nations in our, in our church. Every Sunday morning, it's like, I call it the practice of heaven. You know why? I mean, we have about close to 600 Africans in church. I mean, the Zimbabweans will shout one thing, the Nigerians will shout, and then the New Zealand Pacific Islanders who is not from the Africans will, sh will have a specific shout. The Congolese will have a specific shout. It's a very noisy church. So if you are a peaceful person, don't go to our church. I mean, I mean <laughs> that's basically, it will ruin you. You know what I mean? But, but what I'm just saying is that, is that the, the, the house, a house for nations, there is something that is very, very important in that line. Because when you talk about the church of God being the house of prayer for all nations, that means the church of God should be a place where everyone is looked equally. Now, you're not treated better because of the color of your skin. You're not treated better because you're richer than the other. You're not treated better because you speak louder. You're not treated better because your English is better than the other. I mean, if that would happen in, a, in, in our equipped church, I would not be able to do what I need to do, Pastor Mal. I mean, when I went, you know, I was a missionary back in, um, uh, when God called me to be a missionary for, for Malaysia for, when I was 23 years old. And I have to literally unlearn my Filipino English. I used to say this, oh, hello, let's, uh, let's go to the airport at 445. You know, that, that was my English. Now, I was better than that, of course, yeah. But, but, but it, was, it was this, you know, in Baguio, we're a little, bit, we're a little bit posh, you know. But when I get nervous, the P's and the F's gets combined. And honestly, things that are not supposed to be bad, they become bad. And, and, and then, oh, you know, when you're nervous, especially, you know, with, with us Filipinos, you know. And then the gender changes. You know, you're talking that person, as she, she, she. And I mean... I'm a man, you know, I mean, it just, just think, things change, you know, and, and that, that, that's why I, I, I think the Americans got this idea. Uh, thank God, Pastor, you're Canadian, but they, they, they had this idea of all these crooked things that you can just, it's because of the Filipinos in America. I'm just blaming that. But, but what I'm just saying is, 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 that, is that if that is the basis of your acceptance in church, then that church is not doing it right. Because we are accepted despite who we are and we come to God as we are if you want the church to grow it should not be selective it should be inclusive the enemy had stolen the word inclusivity to make it look like it's inclusive but God does not want to use our church to be a political platform of inclusivity the language that we have in a church is inclusivity because everyone who seeks God have an equal opportunity to do so Come on, give the Lord a big hand for that. The purpose is for all nations, but only God, God will also want us to focus to Him. Because when we do things, the focus should be Jesus. You know, He calls Christians who are not consumers. He calls Christians who are passionate, not lukewarm. He calls Christians who are not willing to compromise. The, the P's and F's came out again. The, 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 he calls Christians not to be convinced, but to be converted. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says that do not conform with the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the, your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Second one, I'll, I'll make it quick for us, yeah? Second one is that it, the, the, when God wants to restore us, He also wants to restore the operation, the activation of the five-fold ministries. Now, this is not what you do when you have an enemy and you just give them the five-fold. That's not what I mean, right? So, uh, you, you, um, you, know, I'll give, uh, you know, in Australia, we would say, you want, to give, you want me to give you the five-fold? Shut up, you know, so they'll give you the five-fold. That's not what I mean. The five-fold ministry is so important, right? The five-fold ministry should be fully activated uh, or actualized in the new era. Not to compete, but to help prepare the bride. No, like the eunuchs in the times of Esther, you know, in Ephesians chapter 4, you know, we, we've tackled this, you know, pastor, uh, our amazing pastors have talked about this, you know, from uh, our, our pastor uh, Marcelo, right? Pastor Marcelo talked about unity and, of course, uh, pastor um, Dennis, you know, uh, I almost said uh, Steven Spielberg, you know, Pastor Spielberg. Uh, well, you know, he, he, he mentioned this, you know, and, uh, and of course, Pastor Mel, you've, you've, you've talked a little bit more of, of uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, today it, it's very encouraging what you said and even, even yesterday. But, you know, when you talk about the fivefold ministries, it's been tackled in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. It says, so Christ himself, you know, it was not people who gave, yeah? Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, God, the goal is that we will go to the full measure of the fullness of Christ. If your discipleship pathway in church is to create leaders, something is wrong. When I'm saying something is wrong, because our discipleship pathway is to create Christians who are willing to serve God. And leadership is the fruit of that outstanding service to God. Because most people think that, oh, if I'm a leader, I can do this. The, the, the kingdom of God does not work based on positions. Based on what your uh, accreditation is. Based on the number, of, um, the number of degrees that you have. It is based on the your ability to serve and be a servant for all. You know, it is not about that. But in order to do that, in order to perfect discipleship, the fivefold ministry need to work together. You know, I, I love that because, because the apostle is the one that builds. He's the pioneer. I mean, I'm glad that in our church, you know, Pastor Mel, I, I can literally say that, you know, you're an apostolic leader. The apostolic leader is, is a pioneer. The, there is also a prophet. The prophet, we need them in the church. Uh, not profit, okay? We, we, need the, we need the profit, not the profit, okay? So I just want to clarify that. The profit is needed because they want us, they ins the, you know, they want us to not be blinded by the works of men to keep us focused to God. Now, the, what else? The pastor is needed because when, the, when people are offended by the prophet, the pastor will take care. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, that's not what it meant. The pastor is there to actually help outwork the leadership of the church and to lead and guide the people. Now, the, the, the other one that is really, really very difficult to work with is not the teacher. You know, the teacher is there. You know, we always think that the teacher is the educator and teaching like that. Sometimes it goes hand in hand. But one of the, one of the defects at the moment with a lot of um, movements is that the evangelists. You know, how many of you are evangelists here? Please don't raise your hand. There are evangelists who are delusional. You know, you know when I'm saying delusional evangelists, they think that they can operate without the cover of the church. You're, if you're an evangelist, you need to partner with what God is doing in the church so you can be released. And when I'm just saying that, because I have evangelists who, they call themselves evangelists, but they go to church. Yeah, I mean, they, they, their goal is to get more preaching inside the church. If you're an evangelist, go in the middle of Zimbabwe or, Z or Zambia or, or somewhere there and then organize and reach out to the, to the people over there. I mean, uh, to the unreached, to the, the people who do not know Jesus. What I'm just saying is that when you are an evangelist, there must be an outworking and submission together that works together with the 
apostle, the prophet of the church, and, uh, and also the, the pastor and the teacher because you are the ones who actually bring the good news. But all of these things is actually to outwork the perfection of the bride, not to compete with each other. It requires unity. I mean, no one is better than the other. You know, you know, some of us, oh, I came from a prophetic church. Everybody's about prophecy. No, you know, the church should be balanced. You know, most of us as people, we, you know, in the kingdom of God, sometimes we go to extremes, you know. We want to go, go here and get, you know. Uh, how many of you have, have seen a person who was, who's, whose hand is like twice the, 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 the length of my hand? And then the, the, the leg is twice the length of my leg. How, do, how would they look like? They will look like a gorilla. And sometimes, because of the dysfunction in unity, we get disfigured. The body of Christ gets disfigured. But when unity is there, when the perfection of uh, who we know, the calling that we have is, is there, you know, we present a perfected bride of Christ. You know, God does not want to look at a disfigured bride. But today, there is, a, there is a need to unite these different ministries together. The third one that I want to emphasize is this, that, that in the restoration, it's not, just, it's not just the return to the original, it's not just the restoration of the fivefold, but there's also a need for a rising of generational partnerships. You know, there's something that has been happening in our youth back home recently, and it's, I think it's a phenomenon happening all over the world right now, that God is actually activating the younger generation in the church. Now, can I just tell you there's something significant in that? Because in the, the next 100 years, the world's population growth will stop for the very first time in history. And there are groups of people that will be growing, you know. In Asia, Asia's growth will slow down at its pace. But also, by the, by the end of the century, the biggest growth will be div driven by Africa. You know, I'm looking at several African brothers and sisters over here. The growth will be driven in the next century by Africa. And what are we doing? Now, when I'm talking about Africa, there's also this massive moment, a window in our world right now that there are more children than adults. Okay? Now, what does that say? That we have a mandate to mobilize a young generation. That if there are more younger people in our church, there must be a generational partnership between the fathers and the sons, between the fathers and the daughters, between the parents and the children. Because for many years, there's always an, um, uh, you know, a, a, a loss of trust between this generation. Because that's how the enemy would want to do, to lose trust. Now, fathers over here, can I just tell you, in, Matthew, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, it says there, you know, when it was talking about when Elijah was being sent, but there's something that caught my attention here. He said, he will turn, you know, the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of their children to the parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. 1 Corinthians 4.15, it says there, Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many father, fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. You know, this is where you outwork your discipleship. It's not a program. It's a relationship. You know, I love what Pastor Dennis Hefner, uh, Dennis Hefner, I'm just, I'm calling you by the whole name, Pastor Dennis, uh, had actually shared that discipleship is based on relationship. It's not based on program. I used to remember when we were younger in, back in Baguio, they forced us to do discipleship. Oh, you have to go to this, to this material. I get bored because, because I feel like I'm already studying in a university. You're putting me in a class again. But I realized discipleship is artwork outside the room of uh, the, four, uh, the, the four corners of a room. It's actually going side by side with people and helping them go through life and make sure that in every moment they fail, you are there to catch them. But also knowing the role of the father and a child is so, so important in this aspect. Because, you know, as father, uh, and, uh, uh, there is a, uh, the, that relationship, discipleship relationship, trust is very important important. You know, the role of the father is so important because the father gives identity. The father gives security. The father gives wisdom. But also what I realize is this, that fathers open doors, open doors for their children. That's, that's what the fathers do. You know, if you have somebody who's discipling and training you and they're opening doors for themselves, they're not real fathers. Real fathers are the ones who would want you to stand on their shoulders so you can jump higher from where they started before. That's what real fatherhood is. 
when I'm saying this, because, because there is always this animosity between uh, father and children sometimes. Because, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a 14-year-old girl. You know, and um, I love my daughter. She's as tall as me now, 14 years old. Every time she passes by, her, her goal in life is to be taller than me. So every morning, every morning, Pastor Mel, with no fail, while I was standing there, she would pass by, and then she would measure me from the back while I'm not looking because I can feel her hand, you know, trying to measure how tall she is. And then she, she, will, she will go in front of me and say, Dad, why are you so small? I said, this is as far as the Asian genes can put me. Not even amount, any, no amount of tongues can actually make me taller. Uh, uh, but, but I looked at that, and there's this funny dynamics between a father and a child, especially the daughter. Because sometimes, the, you know, children, you want, to, uh, you want to prove that you're better than your parents. And as a result, you become the antithesis of your parents. And what you do this time is that everything that your parent didn't do, you will do. Everything that you think that is better, that you will actually do it. You know the problem with that is this? If you live your life as an antithesis of your parents, you will become one and worse than your parent. What I'm just saying, you will lose your ability to, uh, to actually uh, continue a heritage that your parent has started for you. you know, I'm saying this because as, as, as young people, please trust us. We love you. We want to release you. But also, fathers over here, allow your young people to make mistakes. I would just want to conclude with this because the last point that I have is, uh, is about the Holy Spirit, which I, I, I think I would rather uh, pass, this time to, pass that time to Pastor Moises. But can I just tell you that we need to raise an army. And in order to raise an army, we need to disciple the next generation. And in order to do that, Fathers, we need to trust our young people. They may sing songs that we can't sing. They may dance things that we can't dance. When I was looking at the, at the, you know, at the pre-service reel, uh, you know, they may do all those weird stuff. Doesn't matter. We love them, and we want them to be better than us. You know, my, my daughter does, does all this weird stuff, the, the way you guys do it. It's fun. You know, it was fun. It's like, why is she doing this? You know, suddenly she would, you know, it, it feels weird. It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, her language, one, you know, sometimes her language will be, you know, burn, you know, uh, skull, you know. I mean, I said, what are you talking about? Skull, you know, and, and, you know. What language is that? You know, I can't understand her. You know, you know what I do right now is I offend her by actually imitating her. And I said, yucks, why are you doing that? You know, I said, you know, but you can't do that in Australia. Uh, we learn the art of giving discipline without making it obvious. So, uh, 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 but what I'm just saying is that we, we you know, it, it is so weird. But they, when they look at us, they don't understand too. I remember being asked by my, my children, Dad, were you alive when Jesus was born? I mean, you can see the disparity of the awareness of who we are. And that's why we need to have a communication of who, what we, of, of the difference of generation. Because the difference is amazing. It should not divide us, but it also would, must put us into a place that we can recognize that difference. And those differences brings us together to make us better. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Definitely, I was not as old as Jesus. But I know that even though, uh, even though I'm older, I know that one thing that I always love about the young people is that you have a zeal for God. And that's where I will conclude that when God will restore the church, He would increase the zeal of everyone for God. God. God will reawaken your zeal. It's a great energy, enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause for God. Psalms chapter 69 verse 9, it says, For zeal in your house consumes me. Charles, Charles Spurgeon said, when revival comes to a people, uh, he wrote in 1866, who are in the state that was briefly described about, you know, that they're not alive. It simply brings them to a condition in which they ought always to have been. It quickens them. It gives them new life, stares the call of the expiring fire, and puts heavenly bread into the languid lungs. The sickly soul, which, become, which, which before was insensible, weak, and sorrowful, grows earnest, vigorous, and happy in the Lord. There is an incre when God increase when God meets us, there will be an increase for God, an increase of hunger for God's word, a desire for God's pres presence, a motivation to preach the gospel. 
Zeal is so important because zeal is a fruit of repentance. You are not just passionate because you are passionate. It comes from a place of recognizing that we had made our own mistake. We have reached a limit and we are surrendering that human limit to the hands of an unlimitless God. And then when we come to that point of surrender, God meets us. And in that point of surrender where repentance happens, there will be a commitment to holiness. Holiness is required if we want revival to happen in our lives. If we want a restoration to happen in our church. And that revival will happen in a place of recognizing that it is only the power of God that is able to cleanse us. That will be able to release us to outwork the plan of God to expand His kingdom all throughout the world. Today, church, I just want to encourage you because it does not, we don't need a lot of people to start revival. We just need several people. It only takes about 120 people in the upper room waiting in Acts chapter 2 when they were waiting in that, in that middle of this desert place in Jerusalem in the upper room. It was not air conditioned like this. They were inside like sardines. There was no, I'm sure there's no deodorant at that time. I mean, they were sitting down there. They were not expecting anything. You know, God said, Jesus said, wait. I have no idea what that means for you. But for me, waiting is like, why would I wait? They were sitting down there wanting, what is Jesus asking us to wait for? And suddenly, the fresh and wind, you know, there's some sound that broke out. And suddenly they realized that it was the power of that ho the Holy Spirit. From that time on, that sweaty, dusty, smelly upper room became a place, uh, the womb, to actually birth out the church of God. That's why in the next 10 years, you know what's going to happen? It will be the 2,000 year mark of the birth of the church. What are you going to do, church? We need to multiply. But in order to do that, we need to ask God to breathe into us one more time. That He will be able to release us, not because of human understanding, but He will download us to us the right strategy to reach the generation. So when the time comes that Jesus calls us or Jesus comes, we know that we fulfilled the mandate. Can you all stand up to your feet today? And let's just lift up our hands before I pass this time to the next speaker. Because we will have some time to pray after this. We need a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit. We need a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit. And today, wherever you are standing, why won't you lift up your hand? And God, I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that Lord, you will restore your church. Restore it to its original purpose. And Father, today, Lord, we come to repentance, Lord. If we have, if we have done church not according to your will if we have done methods and things that are not really uh, God methods but human methods today Lord we surrender them unto you Lord Father let every agenda today Lord be surrendered under the blood of Jesus that Lord as you restore us once again as you bring us back to the original intent how you would want us to be as your church Father I pray in Jesus name that God Lord you will breathe life into our churches that Lord when we go back to our churches God it will no longer just be us it will be a partnership with you and your divine will that is being given through us Father and Lord I pray and thank you God for this opportunity that we can gather together I pray that you will breathe life into us Lord Holy Spirit restore us once again revive us once again Lord awaken your church that we will rise up and change the world we thank you God in Jesus name we pray Amen Amen